everyone, so welcome. Uh, I think Harrison's just going to share share his screen um, for us today. Um, it's my job. I'm Cathy Holloway. Um, I'm the academic director of GDI Hub and, and also the principal investigator of the Tidal Grant uh, with my wonderful colleagues uh, and collaborators. Um, Richard and Loss are here today. And I think um, Arian and Miko may be able to join. They're doing their best. Uh, so we, we just wanted to showcase uh, the Tidal feasibility projects with you all um, and hopefully begin to build conversations around these um, and also just around the network more generally. We'd love to hear from you to know what other webinars or what other engagement you might like towards the end of this. So the next slide, please, Harrison. So just so everybody's aware, EPSRC funded this collaboration between University College London, Strathclyde, Salford and, and Loughborough Universities. And it, the Tidal Network is, exists to build into the interdisciplinary network of researchers, of which I would hope you were all a part, assistive technology AT users, entrepreneurs and clinical practitioners to help us transform the AT space and improve people's um, lives by identifying and tackling new research challenges, creating novel innovations. So you are all able to help us do this. Um, and the title grants are one of the mechanisms in which we've been able to do that. So that includes funds uh, for people to get, get something off the ground to see whether or not something novel is feasible. It's roughly 60,000 pounds over six months and it enables fundamental early stage research and ideally to attract further investment. On top of the funds, we also provide mentorship, both um, in terms of research, but also in terms of business strategy and innovation strategy. And we work across different themes. So you're going to hear from people across these themes today, it's responsible engineering, digital design and manufacturing systems, DMS and physical devices, and sensors, data science and communication aids. So we want to tell you a little bit more about those. Can next slide, please, Harrison. Um, and which, so we're going to tell you a little bit more about those in a second, and then we're going to showcase the research that we funded that will lay some of the foundations for transformative improvements in assistive technology. We need to find insights, um, demonstrate insights into where some of the latest lines of in research inquiry are heading, and we value your thoughts on, on, on these. And we'd love you to engage with the researchers. They're only going to get five minutes. <laughs> I'm going to have to be really harsh, and I talk a lot anyway. So, um, but Ideally, it's for you to just get a hint and want to follow up the conversation. That's the idea. So we hope that you'll reach out to the researchers after this. So here's the agenda. I won't run through it in total. You get me, then, we, then um, Lawrence, and then Richard, and then me just explaining the themes. And then you hear from all the grant, um, uh, the people who were awarded grants in each of those sections, again, just for five minutes. And then we wrap it up. So I'll hand over, I think, to Loss to talk about the next, uh, to talk about what responsible engineering is. Over to you. Next slide, please, Harrison. <clears throat> you, Loss. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, so I'm uh, Loz Kenny. I'm a professor in rehabilitation technologies at the University of Salford. Um, so just a quick overview of, of why we put a call out in responsible engineering. Um, we know that uh, the UK signed up to the, the Paris Climate Agreement, which aims to keep global temperatures below t two degrees and ideally below one, one and a half degrees. The, the implications for the UK and other countries are, are arguably considerably more urgent than most politicians are prepared to admit. Um, some models suggest we need to be reducing uh, the carbon footprint by around 13% year on year in the UK at least. Um, these are clearly massively ambitious targets and will be impossible without everyone chipping in and, and doing their bit and the assistive technology sector is not alone in in needing to to up up its game in this area so we also know that the demand for assistive technology is increasing and hence we need to be developing novel and innovative ways to deliver assistive technologies in much more climate friendly manner less travel lower carbon footprint of devices Device rejection uh, needs to be reduced and repair services need to be improved. Um, at the same time as this, we've got the climate emergency, climate uh, crisis worsening year on year. So heat stress is um, becoming a, an ever more uh, pressing problem for people like amputees who already um, have problems in that respect. Uh, there's going to be more movement of, of people services need redesigning, et cetera. So we um, put out a call for 
uh, proposals in this area. Uh, we had a reasonable amount of interest and we funded the two uh, top, uh, top ranked proposals and these will be presented next. So over to you, Richard, to tell us a little bit about digital design and manufacturing systems and physical devices. Yeah, so um, we put this call out to um, encourage uh, research in digital design manufacturing systems, which covers quite a, a realm of things, but with a specific focus on physical devices, on the facilitation uh, of a more efficient methods of delivering physical devices, exploiting uh, industry for technologies, digital connectivity, digital manufacturing, whatever uh, phrase you wish to attach to that. But there's lots of opportunities there which are now being developed in mainstream manufacturing, which um, uh, assistive technologies can take advantage of. Uh, so this builds on sort of work that's gone on over years about sort of exploiting computer edge design and additive manufacturing and um, advanced manufacturing techniques, but joining them up, interconnecting people across the internet in order to make those processes more efficient. So the kind of things we were looking for, novel ways to exploit the potentials and the advantages of digital design and manufacturing. So um, we're looking at things like the semi-automated capture of patient data. And we say semi-automated because we don't want to take the expert out of the loop. We don't want to take the clinicians out of the loop. Uh, we want to maintain and empower them to do things more quickly, but not to lose their, their experience and their expertise. We're also looking at remote redistributed or semi-automated computer design of personalized IT. So really the opportunities with industry for technologies, internet uh, and these kinds of digital technologies is the, the design can be separate from the manufacturer. So somebody can be in a remote location involved in capture of patient data. Somebody else can be in a different location engaged in the computer edge design uh, of a personalized AT. And then the manufacturer can be again local or redistributed closer to the point of need, uh, which raises efficiencies. Um, it cuts down on things like shipping, which obviously relates back to um, the previous thing about responsible engineering. So we're sort looking at sort of flexible, adaptable uh, things which are on demand um, uh, and or at the point of care. So rather than having sort of mass production and factories and shipping and stock holding, then um, people are getting things what they need, when they need it, um, with a, a more efficient workflow. Um, so we've tried to encourage projects in that area, and obviously we'll see some of those uh, later in the webinar. Thanks. So um, we had 11 expressions of interest, uh, which turned into seven applications, um, which were all uh, eligible, shortlisted down to six. And then obviously, as with the other calls, we funded two out of that. Um, the total value of £230,000, for that call. So. Thanks, Richard. And I'll just take it back up with census data science and communication aids. Um, and so this seeks to investigate novel ways to exploit advances in ubiquitous sensing, but also data science to improve, uh, to drive improvements in assisted living devices. So. We know probably everyone in the call knows we've got this drive for low cost ubiquitous sensing technologies. They exist everywhere. Our mobile phones <clears throat> carry immense technology just within them. However, sometimes the, these tools are not yet being used to inform the design or the provision or the use of assistive technologies or even to um, help support clinical support decisions. So we wanted to fund things that would, would do that uh, or would look maybe at new assistive living devices, which leverage advances in sensors, data science and communication aids, again, pointing to the fact that people want to, to live at home longer in, when they age. And then finally, look at sensors and data science advances to improve things like uh, communication aids, such as hearing aids, sign language interpretation, augmented alternative, alternative communication devices, and also assisted living decision making within healthcare. And so when we were putting the, the grant together, actually, we really did try to pull out the idea of communication aids because a lot of um, the we thought within digital manufacturing systems and even responsible engineering, a lot of it might fall back to more um, physical mobility devices, which is, has been the case. So we were delighted to get some great um, some great applications in this area. And move to the next slide, Harrison. We. We had a so we had a call three where we had 20 expressions of interest, um, which led to 11 applications All 11 uh, were qualifying applications. We shortlisted eight 
and then two were recommended, um, which went to funding panel and were approved, and, and the total value is £118,494. Um, I, I will just make a, a, a general note about the fact that all of the funding decisions were really hard, and, and something we were all, you know, the ones that were three and four and five, it was, you know, it was really challenging. So anybody who's listening who didn't get funded, don't think we didn't have a lot of conversation to, to make sure that the top two were the top two. But it was very, very close. So um, thank you for, I suppose, taking up hours of our time, desperately making a very difficult decision. But it was it was great to see the quality um, of the applications that came through. And so I think on time, even with a couple of minutes to spare, which one of you can get to eat into, um, I'm going to turn over to the, the first set of um, presentations, which is by Michael, I believe. So, Michael, I'll, um, I'll set my timer uh, and uh, you get to get to tell us all about an affordable and flexible prosthetic socket. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just that blue writing that says mechanic underscore AL, there so seems to be some things missing, but it was all of our Twitter handles in case you guys wanted. <laughs> we're, all, we're on Twitter, so you can follow us. <laughs> Next slide, please. So globally, the number of lower limb amputees is on the rise. Uh, among lower limb amputees, mobility is highly correlated with quality of life as it enables the prosthetic user to become an active member of the communities that they live in and to engage in activities like standing, walking, and carrying loads. The mobility ash additionally increases employability, helping families and promoting local and global economic growth. The manufacture and delivery of these devices in LMICs often falls to humanitarian organizations and charities with occasional governmental aid. This limits the number of lower limb amputees who can receive a prosthetic. Many LMICs utilize prosthetic technology that requires hard polypropylene plastic uh, to build the socket or the part of the device that interacts with the person and a trained prosthetic to make this, dev this device. And it can take them sometimes a few days. Because of this, many lower limb amputees go without prosthetics or are stuck with ill-fitting sockets. This can cause medical problems like skin lesions due to friction between the socket and residual limb. Uh, and this is particularly prevalent if the person gains or loses a few pounds and therefore their residual limb changes shape and size. The hard poly polypropylene plastic additionally needs to be shipped in from places like Switzerland, which can create quite a large carbon footprint, especially if going to areas of the world like Southeast Asia and is not recyclable. And so just ends up in the trash afterwards. So a flexible lower limb prosthetic socket made from sustainable locally uh, sourced materials would decrease the time to manufacture a prosthetic device, increasing the number of people who can get it, and it could uh, reduce the carbon footprint by using local resources and being uh, designed in a sustainable manner. Next slide, please. For this project, uh, we faced several engineering challenges. Uh, and this had to do with the actual creation of the device, the manufacture, and the design as well. Uh, one of the big things is it has to be both rigid and flexible at the same time, which in engineering worlds is uh, kind of counterintuitive. It must be rigid in terms of supporting, uh, that needs to be load bearing to support a person's body weight uh, and allowing them to transfer the high loads from the residual limb to the prosthetics, that way it can move during locomotion and support their weight when they're standing or walking. You must resist high bi-directional shear loads, and I mean both the force, uh, the shear forces that occur when the residual limb is pulling out of the socket as the prosthetic is being lifted off the ground, and when it's pushing into the socket as they're weight bearing on it. It must resist high cyclic loads uh, for years. So if a person is walking uh, the 10,000 steps a day that we are aiming for, that means that it needs to resist over 150,000 loads a year. Now, in terms of sustainability, we looked at this not in, only in terms of the resources, so using materials that are sustainable and methods for manufacture that are sustainable, but also in terms of the skills of the people that are making these devices, because locally in a lot of these countries, they have very different skill sets than we do here, and also to make them culturally appropriate. And we believe that this is important in terms of sustainability because if we make if we design a device that can't be manufactured with the skill sets in these countries, sure, we can go in and train them, but then those skills are often lost as we've seen with other uh, devices and systems in the past. It's also important that this is circular. So whatever the material is made out of can be recycled and reused for other purposes afterwards. And important to all of this, in particular, the sustainability aspect with local skills is the co-design um, is co-design, which is uh, we are 
getting information using the double diamond approach with groups both in Sri Lanka, which we've just gathered that information and are processing it now, and in Cambodia. Next slide, please. So uh, what's next for us? One of the things we're, like I said, we've gathered our co-design data with Sri Lanka, but we are currently gathering it in Cambodia. After that is done, we're going to be creating CAD models of our designs uh, as we process that data and prototyping two to three different designs, which are then going to be mechanically tested with the University of Southampton. Ideally, after this is done, we will move on to larger projects which focus on ISO testing, preclinical and clinical trials, and either uh, going the route of future grants or potentially a startup company and getting money from agencies like Innovate UK. We also believe that education is really important to this project, and so we have uh, two MSc theses which are looking at this, and we also are drawing in undergrads and uh, PhD students um, to this project in addition to educating some of the people we're working with. So, thank you. Thank you. That was bang on time. Well done. <laughs> I'll take my hand down. Um, great. So, that was really fascinating. Um, and before we have any the discussion which can go in the chat so please do jump in jump in with questions to michael i'm sure he'd love to hear some we're going to go, go straight to lean and to talk about a person-based approach to the development of upper limb prosthesis over to you lean thank you um so yeah as kathy mentioned my name is lean japan and i'm one of the co eyes on this project a person-based approach to the development of upper limb prosthesis so the pre next slide please So the previous talk was on lower limb prostheses. Our focus is on upper limb prostheses. So to give you a bit of a background, um, of over 5,000 upper limb amputations happen in the UK every year. Um, of those, up to, up, up to half use myoelectric prostheses, like the one shown on the right, which include uh, EMG sensors that detect the uh, muscle activation to control the limb. Those devices on average cost around $60,000, and despite their high cost, up to 75% reject their prostheses. There are lots of reasons behind that, but one main one is that the devices do not match the user's expectations. Not only is this wasteful, it also reduces the quality of life and can lead to long-term issues due to the overuse of the intact limb. We are, next slide please. In our project, we're specifically looking at sensory feedback and touch is vital for ob object manipulation. So, and it's a big part of how humans interact with the world. The addition of sensory feedback to upper limb prostheses has shown to improve control, increase embodiment and reduce phantom limb pain, which all could potentially lead to reduce abandonment. And the research on sensory feedback has been going on for over hundred years. Um, however, it's still not a feature, uh, a standard feature in upper limb prosthesis. And so why is that the case? There's a research challenge of fully understanding user needs and how the intervention actually helps them in their daily lives. Uh, we've had surveys and interviews with the users, but we found that they actually need to try it to be able to imagine how it fits in their life. Next slide, please. So co-creation uh, is the key to understanding uh, user needs properly by having the user as part of the research team. But if you think about it, um, it's a bit of a difficult thing to do because you wanna understand user needs to build a device, but you want them to try the device to understand user needs. So you end up with a iterative design process that can sometimes be um, slow. What we're trying to do is speed it up and make it more effective by using the Internet of Things. So the figure I've got here on the slide describes how we're trying to do that. So we're building a kit uh, that we can ship to the user uh, that includes sensors and vibration motors to build a sensory feedback system um, that they can attach to their existing prosthesis. This kit is connected to the internet, so we are able to, with consent of course, track how they're using it. They're able to change settings and that is also recorded. To give context to 
how the users are using the prosthesis. We have we are scheduling weekly interviews um, and with the help of psychologists to actually understand the behaviors and that lead to how the device is being used. So those interviews, for example, um, we can ask the user why they regularly change a specific setting and that could indicate an area of improvement. Um, and based on that, we can modify the code and use over the air updates um, to change those specific settings or things they can control and see the impact of that on their use. So this allows us to speed up the process of this co-design and co-creation. And sensory feedback is the first um, project we're using as a case study, but the aim is to look at how we can do, how you can use technology to make co-creation more effective and lead to better designs of assistive technologies that reduce abandonment and improve quality of life. Brilliant, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a fantastic talk. Um, and I see that you've uh, got, do you want to say something about your research team before we finish? That's, thank you to all the research team. <laughs> Thanks, right. And if you have any questions, get in touch with us. And I see that some of them are, uh, have joined the call as well. So I'm sure they'll be able to, to chip in and answer some questions as well. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. I'm going to move on now to um, digital design and manufacturing. So the next slide, please. And over to Nicola uh, to talk to us about the remote capture of patient data for bespoke socket design. It's a lot of prosthetics. <laughs> it's like a masterclass. Off you go. OK, thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? So why do we really need this research? Well, in the UK, the number of people with a limb difference is increasing. This is both in terms of people are born with a limb difference, as well as those who have lost a limb due to trauma. And NHS is responsible for over 55,000 patients per CCs. So this is at a cost of about 60 to 80 million pounds each year, and it involves around 35 centres. And each of these centres has a specialised multidisciplinary team to be able to provide the service. And each of these receives between 50 and 350 new referrals every year. And people that have had a limb amputation or have a limb difference can face serious disabilities, both in terms of physical and psychosocial, and this can compromise their daily life. But what research has found is that actually having a prosthetic can really help these people, especially those who've lost a limb through trauma, to start to gain their recovery, making them feel complete once again, and able to live an independent life and feel included into society. However, it's really important that these prostheses do meet user needs. So this includes the functionality, the comfort, reliability, and their affordability. So next slide, please. So one thing to wear a prosthesis is that you actually need the interface between the prosthetic itself and the residual limb. And this is called the socket. So this socket needs to be personalized and it needs to fit the person's residual limb well in order for it to be comfortable and for the user to be able to use the functionality well. If it isn't right, then this can cause a high rejection rate and the prosthetic can just sit in a cupboard for the rest of its life. Now, ideally, what we want is this socket to be designed quickly, allowing the person to return to a normal life, including gaining their full independence. Now, on average, this can take between four to five weeks at the moment, and this can take multiple trips toward, to a clinic. So it can take lots of iterations, including multiple test sockets. And even when the final test socket is designed, we can have lots of tweaks and modifications that are still needed. Now, the most common way that this is currently done, so the way that the socket is designed, is that we need to capture the residual limb geometry. And this is done through a system that is based on taking plastic casts of the residual limb. Now, this can be time consuming. It's quite a wasteful process and it's very resource intensive as it's a long labored process that is very hands-on. Next slide, please. So there has been some recent emergence of digital technologies and lots of technical, technological advances, including 3D scanning. Now, 3D scanning has the potential to transform socket fabrication procedures. And some clinics are starting to use 3D scanners to implement the capture of residual limb data and the benefits of this from a clinician's point of view is that it gives an accurate representation of the residual limb, both in terms of the limb shape and volume. It can give quantitative information 
and it allows the tracking of the residual limb as time goes by. So this can result in an improved fit of the socket, giving an enhanced user experience and can help reduce prosthetic abandonment. So the aim of our project is to basically take this technology and try and take it away from the clinics, so into a person's home, for example. Now, the big challenge with this is we're going to have to develop technology that can be used on something that everybody has, so such an example, a mobile phone or a camera, and develop some methodology to take this information to be able to remotely capture all the patient data from which a custom socket can be designed. So what we want to do is alleviate the burden of travel for the person having the prosthetic fitted, reduce the costs and minimize any timescales whilst providing maximum effective care and removing many barriers that currently exist to improve access to prosthetics. So where could this go in the future? There are many different areas which this research could go. So for example, if we're able to accurately capture the patient data remotely away from a clinic, we could then look at trying to extend this into creating the socket design remotely, passing it off to a clinician who can then make any final adjustments using their expertise uh, in order for it to then be manufactured. We can also look at the effectiveness of the socket by putting sensors into it. And we can look at providing care to remote locations or countries that currently don't have these provisions. But the long-term effect of all of this is to be able to provide a shift change in socket development with improved experience for everybody involved. So what we want to do is provide an order of magnitude gain in efficiency and responsiveness while minimizing the travel and reducing waste whilst accelerating the process and still enabling specialist clinic clinicians to see as many patients as possible and providing a good level of care. So level of care the patients see will not be reduced. So all of this will hopefully drive down costs and therefore will remove any a key hindrance that many users have at the moment. So this is just our research team. So it's also a learner Seminati, who's a lecturer in clinical biomechanics and working with the Alex Lewis Trust to make sure that user needs are met the whole way through this project. Brilliant, thank you. And next slide, Harrison. Thanks so much. You came, there's the, there's the, um, <laughs> thanks, Elena. Um, I do also see that somebody, uh, one of the participants has their hand up, uh, so I, I, we can't take questions uh, verbally at the moment, we won't have time unfortunately, so if you can put them in the Q&A that's great, if, if you're not able to then um, I will try and reach out to you um, uh, some, some other way to get your question. But uh, I'm going to move on quickly because we're keeping to time, which I'm really quite impressed with, so uh, Ben the pressure is on you now. <laughs> <laughs> to keep that when you do the yeah. algorithmic design of functionally graded prosthetic liners off you go hi yes yeah, so my name is ben Osri, yeah, and i'll be giving a, a quick overview of our project uh, algorithmic design of functionally graded prosthetic liners which is a collaboration between groups at university college london university of southampton uh, and radii devices um so in prosthetics and orthotics uh, the use of digital manufacturing uh, is rapidly accelerating really exciting things happening um, however, it's still, it's still focused on the rigid material prosthetic componentry that's available. Um, and the thing is, is that, that we're soft. Um, and yeah, we're interested in what we, could, what we can do in terms of soft technology. Um, yeah, this slide, yeah. So um, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the interface between the residual limb and the socket, or is often called the stub socket interface, uh, it still presents a lot of challenges around comfort, fit, um, and, and more and more people, uh, more ubiquitously are wearing softer, less emeric liners between the socket and the limb uh, that help to reduce shear stress on the skin, increase comfort, um, and they just, for particular areas, they give a higher cushioning effect uh, on the bony prominences. Um, but how could these be improved? Particularly maybe, you know, thinking about people that have residual limbs with troublesome topologies, uh, that, you know, shapes that are difficult to fit for prosthetists, there might be heavy scar tissue, or the residual limb volume might be varying greatly. I mean, they do daily, they do seasonally, um, but what could be done? So next slide, please. So looking to nature, let's think about those tissues that are actually in the residual limb or other parts of the body, other parts of nature. Well, nature creates these incredible interfacing mediums between hard and soft materials uh, in the body um, by grading between the connecting tissues um, for different reasons in different places. Uh, and thinking about our problem, well, this grading of tissue, what it does is it spreads the stresses being translated. So rather than concentrating stress at a specific point, um, it spreads it across that interface, um, which 
you know, has potential to, to increase the possible force transfer at an interface um, and reduce the, the tolerance to damage because it isn't creating these, these maxima of stress or, or the interface between different components within the device mm -hmm. and then onto the residual load. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, next slide, please. So um, additive manufacturing is now, you know, it allows, you know, for, for us to think about these things with multi-material printing, structurally complex products uh, that, we, that we couldn't previously create. And so we're really interested if we can incorporate these ideas into the technology for the stump socket interface. You know, we want to look at ways of, you know, potentially making bespoke optimized material properties across the interface that could be created uh, for the varying tissues of the residual limb. So, you know, this could be grading perpendicular to the interface, although thin, that's one area that we, we're, we're really interested in exploring, you know, potentially really creating very, very soft materials up against the residual limb um, and, and otherwise, you know, something a little bit more akin to the socket, socket at the other side. Um, but maybe that's not the, we want to explore whether that's the right, the right question to be asking. Um, also, you know, if there's parallel to the limb, if there's different tissue properties um, around the surface of the residual limb, um, but really exciting is to be able to think about programming the material properties of the liner interface, um, you know, dictated by the local properties of the residual limb, the needs of the user and their use type running, for example, presents uh, different problems uh, within the socket as opposed to, to warping or otherwise. So, yeah, so next slide, please. And so really, along with these new ways of manufacturing, um, Across the board for, for, all, for, all, for all components, really, um, we need newly applicable repair strategies. We need to devise these if we're not really going to be exacerbating what is also a really real problem in the repairability of these devices. Um, for, for liners, repair barely happens at all. Um, and that's OK, maybe in some settings. Um, but for, for, for the liners, you know, these are replaced once, twice a year. It could be more, more frequent than that. And that's, this adds up to, to, to a great amount of waste and expense um, over the lifetimes of users. And if we, you know, if we if we are if we're thinking about more advanced technologies, uh, we need to be reducing the you know the the value and the cost that we're putting into that. We need to be fixing these things rather than just throwing away something more expensive. And at the more the most at the at the simpler end of simply allowing a product to be available to somebody in low resource settings, well, this this you know this this low you know, continued use of the device, it puts up huge barriers for potential users in low resource settings. Um, and if we can be, be fixing something and creating efficiencies and costs, then that can open up liner technologies in these settings. And it also has a knock-on effect to other socket technologies, for example, that, that require a liner to work. Um, okay, next slide, thanks. So um, therefore, so building on the materials development work that we've done at UCL on soft material structures and liner technology, uh, and the exciting predictive socket design and modeling work uh, that's been done at University of Southampton and the now spin out company Radi Devices, we aim for the following with this project. So we want to model and produce new functionally graded material interfaces uh, for improved comfort of the socket interface, uh, along with developing repair strategies to match these advanced manufacturing techniques. So the objectives are to fabricate a set of novel graded patches, uh, model the socket interface with respect to optimizing the stress profile. Want to develop a device level custom testing line implementing these developments. And finally, look at a repair and maintenance technique appropriate to these material structures. Um, and then the next slide, please. Yeah, and then, yeah, that's our, that's our team there. Um, yeah, so looking forward. And so myself and Alex and Elsa and Joshua will report back uh, when we've made some progress. Thanks very much. Brilliant, thank you, Ben. Uh, we're going to move quickly on to uh, Timothy, uh, who's going to talk to us about bespoke entry level wheelchair rugby chairs to advance distributed manufacturing. Uh, hello, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my name is Tim Whitehead from Aston University, and um, if we get to the next slide, great. Uh, so this builds on a project we've been doing with the British Council and the University in South Africa, Central University of Technology. And what we're really looking at is the design of rugby wheelchairs, particularly for younger people, so kind of six to 11 year olds. Um, and prior work kind of identified that there's really a lack of chairs for that um, age group um, to get into the sport. And obviously, kind of a lot of what people have been saying isn't the, the, the main barriers to entry is cost of the chairs, importing, shipping, 
um, that's always very problematic. Um, but also looking from a user-centered design point of view, we found that um, lots of uh, young females particularly uh, were quite intimidated by existing wheelchair design and they wanted something that was maybe a little bit softer and, and more friendly. Um, and we also have issues as well with things like discomfort um, over long periods of time in use, um, again, due to the, the, the size and makeup of the chair relative to the person that goes into it. Next slide. So, uh, so again, sort of prior work where this is all built on. Uh, in our previous project, we um, designed a, a wheelchair concept for wheelchair rugby, um, but really we're using this as a case study uh, to look at how we can actually use, probably ne next slide maybe, uh, how we can use a distributed manufacturer and topology optimization. So this project uh, specifically, uh, we're looking at 3D printed wheelchairs, uh, we're going to topology optimize them, so put the material where it's needed for the right impact um, uh, support uh, wh wh where we need it. Um, and we're then going to be able to customize the wheelchairs based on the child's size. Um, we're going to kind of particularly focus with this on, on rugby wheelchairs, um, and we're going to look at different 3D printing methods to enable us to achieve that. Um, so basically, um, yeah, I, I, my objectives, I thought they were on the other slide, but sorry, I must have missed them off. Uh, really, we want to understand the, the real needs of the users uh, using a user design approach. So we're going to do some workshops and focus groups. Uh, we're going to establish all the impact requirements. Um, and then we're going to create uh, approximately five to seven chairs uh, in different forms um, as the case study. But ultimately, we're looking at how can we manufacture these locally. So again, take the CAD files. Uh, to take the data from the UK, send it over to South Africa and other places for them to print locally and test them there. And the team is, yep, yeah, so myself, uh, we're working with our, our partner, Century University of Technology in South Africa, um, and we've also got other partners at Loughborough. That's me. Brilliant, thanks, Tim. Um, so I hope everyone's keeping up. It's a rapid, rapid uh, fire of projects, but it's all very exciting. Um, as they come at us. So the next one is um, our last one in the, D, the, the DDM, uh, Digital Design and Manufacturing Stream. And it's about improving the efficiency of code designing personalized assistive technology through utilizing digital design and manufacturing systems. Over to you, Jonathan Howard. Uh, thank you. Um, so my name is Jonathan. Uh, I'm a clinical scientist working in the NHS um, in their rehabilitation engineering unit up in Swansea. Um, and why it's research matters. So looking around why people aren't using assistive technology, uh, we know things like lack of customization of designs an issue, um, as well as a lack of end user involvement um, in the design process, as well as knowing that there are instances where there are no devices currently available, either through NHS services or off the shelf, and they're able to meet end users needs. Um, however, we also know the issues aren't only linked to the design of devices, and there are issues to do with the service provision of devices as well, um, awareness and information, um, as well as some of the psychological barriers that individuals may have come to, to wanting to use assistive technology. Um, we found these barriers to be common across different uh, health conditions as well. Um, so our previous research, um, we looked to really co-design on a one-to-one -one basis with patients um, to see how we could provide uh, personalized assistive devices uh, to meet the end user's needs. Um, this is looking at really simplized devices, uh, aids of daily living, um, for example, helping with writing, tying hair, taking medication, um, using cutlery and things like that. Um, we we're able to use a, a range of kind of uh, computer aided design and additive manufacturing uh, to help produce these devices um, for different functional needs. Um, when we evaluated this with individuals and we found that the benefits went beyond just the functional use of the device, um, things like independence, um, it reduced burden on others or family and friends. There's on some psychological benefits associated with using the device, things like improved confidence, um, a sense of achievement, um, as well as kind of positive emotions that people felt. And these are all really linked to, to mental health outcomes as well as well as the kind of physical use of the devices. Um, so we've shown through doing this um, on a small scale how we can improve health and well-being outcomes and improve on things like be, uh, people being able to self-manage their own needs. Um, regarding the co-design process itself, individuals were really positive about being involved. They felt empowered that their needs were listened to by working on that one-to-one -one basis um, to produce devices. Um, as well as we got feedback that individuals really hope that these designs could be reused and repurposed um, to meet other people's needs. Um, and we've done a little bit of that work originally, looking at how we can take um, one of the devices, see provided to other individuals, and we look at modification of it as well, using things like parametric design software. So we can easily modifiable 
the low cost and um, using additive manufacturing. Um, this is, again shows how we can maybe produce this in a resource efficient way by being able to reuse designs rather than having to design from scratch every single time. Um, they were limited though in our findings by you know small sample size um, and it was kind of primarily undertaking a single setting. So really looking to do is how we can scale up um, this approach. But we're, we're, the positive outcome so far means we're hopeful to be able to scale this up. Uh, next slide, please. So the current aim of this project um, is to look to identify what components are within the current um, system and the current service and how we can um, more effectively utilize digital design and manufacturing um, to produce devices and able to scale it. Um, we're not only looking at how the improve the design of devices, but we're also looking at from a service level as well, from a clinical service providing the end devices to users, um, and how therefore it can interact within the healthcare services to provide it at the point of care. Um, so what we're aiming to do within this study is to identify what are the current barriers that are preventing the scaling of this co-design approach on a more wider scale, um, how we can better utilize digital design and manufacturing um, within that system, um, and then eventually kind of define what the requirements for a service going forward to co-designing personalized assisted technology. Um, this will help identify future research and development um, opportunities. Um, long term, we're hopeful this approach will improve wider access to clinical services that are really looking to utilize a user-centered design um, within the provision of personalized assistive technology. Um, we're hoping this is both in a, in a local level, a national level, and potentially international level and how best practice can be shared um, amongst different uh, clinical services. Um, and therefore, re future research proposals we look to test and further develop um, from the outcomes of this study. Next slide, please. And this is the research team who will be involved uh, in collaborative working on this project. Brilliant, thank you, Jonathan, that was excellent. As a project I think is very exciting. Um, so I hope everyone else does too. <laughs> um, I'm going to move on uh, now. We're, we're switching uh, switching themes to sensors, data, and communication aids, um, and over to Duncan Williams to talk about um, exploiting wearable sensors for improved communication of music via hearing aids and consumer devices. Over to you, Duncan. Thanks, Cathy. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Duncan from the University of Salford in Manchester, and this project is about improving uh, hearing aids. So. You, you may not know this about hearing aids, but they're generally designed to target speech frequencies. And lots of people that would benefit from using their hearing aids decide they don't want to because they there's a sort of a lower take up on them um, because they make other things not sound very nice. And one of the things that we kind of like to listen to is music and traditional hearing aid designs are really bad at uh, dealing with the way that music sounds. So really what we want to do is to give people with hearing impairments a better quality of access to music because of the associated health and well-being. Um, oh, excuse me, that's a timer, I think. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, health and well-being um, benefits that music and making music and listening to music uh, kind of promotes. So this is um, a proof of concept uh, study and um, what we're hoping to do is combine listening with uh, headphones or with uh, hearing impaired audiences through their own um, hearing aid devices with wearable sensors like the type of sensor we're seeing in the photo here, which is an electroencephalograph, um, if you've come across that before. Um, also galvanic skin response um, and possibly other types of biosensors as well. We feel it's sort of timely because we've got an aging population um, and hearing impairment is cumulative. So you know, we never really get improvements apart from using things like cochlear implants or targeted hearing aids. And we're also seeing a large growth in the use of earphones and headphones. So beyond um, people who currently suffer with uh, hearing impairments, that that kind of technology is really um, aimed at people with normal hearing, quote unquote, which actually is really kind of a minority um, of the population. Uh, Harrison, would it be all right to go to the next slide, please? Uh, thank you. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so why are we sort of hoping to do this and how are we hoping to do this? 
Um, there's a lot of music out there. Uh, it's something that you might not realize, but you consume music for more than sort of 18 hours a week, uh, whether that's on TV or in restaurants. Um, and amateur musicians make up something like just shy of a million people in the UK. We know that music is important to people and that it has all kinds of physiological reactions and it can actually help mentally as well with people feeling lonely. We noticed that a lot over uh, the lockdown. Um, and a one in six people in the UK will have um, uh, some form of degenerative hearing loss. So this effect on humans harms their ability to interact with music and enjoy music. And that creates this sort of disengagement uh, with music that, that's the knock-on effect. So how are we hoping to do this? Well, we want to run pilot studies in our listening uh, rooms, which is what you see here. Um, we're going to work with, uh, we've already got a kind of a, a mailing list of um, people that would be in the initial target audience from two existing projects dealing with how to use machine learning to improve hearing aids for this type of audience. And we're going to combine that with biosensors. Um, and what we intend to do with all of that is very similar to some of the other projects we've already been hearing about. We want to build a stakeholder engagement. We want to create a roadmap for where we would go with this and have a kind of co-design approach to how we can improve people's music experience using hearing aids. Um, the last slide, I think, will be one of the project team. Thank you. Um, so with colleagues from the University of Leeds um, and uh, you know, there's a sort of rogues gallery there. Um, I hope it's interesting for you and I'd love to hear from any of you um, if you've got ideas. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Duncan. That's very exciting. Um, and we move to our final speaker of the day, which is Matthew Dyson from Newcastle, who's going to talk to us about physiological validation of a novel photonic biosensor. Over to you, Matthew. Yeah. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, I think because I've got the advantage of going last, so I think everybody now um, is aware of what um, electromyography is. Um, so it, EMG is a technique that's commonly used to um, measure muscle activity. So there's a range of other ways that you can measure muscle activity. People use um, mechanical sensors or magnetic sensors, and typically all of them um, have some advantages and some disadvantages. So it's been known for some time that you can also use photonic or um, optical sensors to uh, monitor muscles. So with these systems, the principle is always that light is either projected into or onto the body and sensors observe um, what's reflected back. So the images on the right hand side are um, a, a photonic sensor that's been in development um, at Newcastle University. It's the, primarily the work of a PhD student called Jacopo Franco. So the, um, the larger image on the right hand side shows the, the sensor as it currently is. And the image um, on the top right um, shows the output of um, unfiltered output from the photonic sensor in comparison to raw um, EMG data. So we can see that the photonic sensor appears to track um, roughly the same signal as um, electromyography. At the moment, we have a relatively small um, sensor. The image on the right hand side shows it's around the size of a pound coin. And um, we followed what we told is the traditional engineering approach of building something, finding it works, and now having to work out exactly how this thing is working. So when we look at the literature for optical sensors, there's multiple explanations, um, many of which contradict one another as to, as to why these sensors work. So the objectives of what we're going to be doing in this work is to work out whether or not the muscle sensor measures muscle expansion, whether or not it's affected by changes in skin blood flow, and to what degree it's actually looking at um, muscle oxygenation. Um, another area that we really, oops, sorry, but another area that we, we still want to look at, um, uh, which is, an equally problematic area is um, this this concept of um, I think it, it, the, the the topic came up as uh, during COVID is racial bias in um, uh, pulse oximetry systems that it's very easy to develop a technology um, but if you're not testing it on 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 a wide population you don't know we don't know who who these sensors will work with so one of the primary goals is to work out what the influence of skin color will be on on an optical sensor that's attempting to project light into the body. So next slide, please. So um, what is next? So we really we're sort of here now looking at the what, what we think, where we think this technology will be in say five or 10 years time. Um, 
that each of these sensors um, contains a microprocessor. They're built with um, following sort of the more um, more modern approach where you don't go from an analog signal, you digitize on site. And because you're digitizing on site, um, each sensor could communicate with one another. So the image on the, on the top left has two sensors that are connected via I squared C and in theory, these things can, can talk to one another. And so because they can talk to one another, um, you could arrange them into a network of an arbitrary shape. And so um, the image on the, on the right hand side is, is Jacopo Franco sitting in, in our experimental chair and it's part of um, some of the piloting we did for this. And so what we think um, can be done is you, you can build a network of these devices and then you, you should be able to then place this network somewhere on the body and essentially image in real time the muscular activity which is going on underneath the skin. So the um, the raster image shows um, it's meant to line up with, with, with Jacopo's arm on the other one. So we can do this at the moment in non-real time. It takes an awful lot of time to actually do it. But what you can see there is the dark blue patch. Um, that's the muscle and the tendon activity associated with um, Jacopo moving his finger there in the image. And so the, the positive part is the outputs of these systems are really highly interpretable and, and should, you should be able to output entirely in real time. So the last slide, I think, um, why does this matter? We think this aligns completely with low cost and ubiquitous sensing technologies. The sensors are incredibly low power, um, cost, very, very low power. You can actually make them below low power because they can switch off when they're not working. Um, they can improve understanding of muscle biochemistry, physiology and pathology, and they align with them, the requirements of the NHS long-term plan for monitoring muscle health in the home. Um, last slide is the project team. So the project team is Jenny um, Olson. Um, she's doing mechanical uh, work on the housing. Jacopo Franco has developed this sensor. Annette Pantel is doing our um, clinical work and Patrick Degenart is an optoelectronics expert um, at Newcastle University. Well, that's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so that was a whistle stop tour of all of the projects that we funded. Harrison, I think you can stop sharing your screen. Um, there's a couple of questions that are still in the chat. Uh, one of them is on tissue uh, engineering as a, as an, a different approach to uh, prosthetic manufacturing and um, I I think others might be wanting to take that up as a as a conversation but I'm not sure we have time in the few minutes we've got left to fully cover <laughs> to cover that point but um but I do take it so if others want to quickly type an answer that'd be great I have no idea who Matthew is related to it's not something I found out so I'll let him declare that if he so wishes um otherwise I uh, think that was a wonderful um rec you know rec a quick whistle stop that's the word I'm searching for whistle stop tour of everything um I personally found each and every um uh, presentation really interesting even though I'd already read the applications it's nice to see them brought to life by you I wonder if we should have video entries next time <laughs> um, they're quite they're quite um it's a bit more exciting isn't it than reading a couple of pages I just want to hand over to Loss or Richard or Arian in case you had any um final thoughts before we close out no just to thank everyone for speaking and and for doing the research uh, and for sticking to time it's amazing well, well I know I'm, I'm really impressed I'm really impressed Loss Arian uh, nothing, nothing further to add. Um, just uh, I agree with Kathy's comments. It's lovely to to see the projects up and running now, um, and uh, a really interesting spread of uh, spread of novel ideas. So that's great. Thank you. I can say something too, of course. Um, and they're just really, really interesting guys. Um, I fully appreciated that um, for the outline what Cathy is saying. And I'm looking very much forward to the next step in the pro in in, in the projects where there are results to show. So looking forward to that. Okay. Brilliant. And so there's just a final call from me then is just to say that um well, we can do more things. We can do more events. Um, we'd like to hear what you'd like. So if this was interesting to you, do let us know. If, if it wasn't, do let us know. Um, we, you know, we keep, we keep trying to get better and we, you know, the Tidal Network is yours. So um, just let us know how you'd like us to shape it. And otherwise, we'll definitely hear from all of these guys again once the projects have completed so you can see what their progress was like. Um, no pressure, guys. <laughs> Guys being a gender neutral term in my world. <laughs> um, excellent. I shall see you all soon. Thank you very much. And thanks, Harrison, for doing the slides and, and for the captioners for, for keeping us captioned. Take care. Bye bye. Good, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Hi, Marison. I don't know if you're still there. So we still have people on, on call, about 29 participants. Okay, brilliant. I'm just going to stop recording now.